I found the science behind what makes a magic wand work, so you can understand what wizards and witches are actually doing. Just make sure you pick the right wand, because as I'll show you later, if you don't, very bad things happen. Magic wands are special tools that exist to focus magic into usable spells. Seeing how wandless magic is incredibly random, if not downright impossible for anyone to use who's not already incredibly skilled. Every wand has to have two critical components for it to work, being the specific type of wood it's made out of and the wand's unique core. That can come from any magical creature, although some are better than others. Due to these two components, every wand is unique and its character will drastically change depending on the combination of wood and magical core used. For instance, if aspen wood is used, then the wand's owner is said to be destined to be an accomplished duelist as the wood itself is more suitable for wizards and witches who use martial types of magic. On the other hand, rowan wood is attracted to those with pure hearts and amplifies defensive spells. Walnut is attracted to highly intelligent owners and will perform any spell without question once subjugated, while if the rare elder wood is used, it rejects wizards who aren't seen as superior, refusing to perform any spells. And this list goes on and on with some wands outright refusing to let anyone else that's not the proper owner use them. Only a minority of trees can produce wand quality wood just as a minority of humans can produce magic. And it takes someone with years of experience like Ollivander to tell the difference. Just as the wand's specific wood is suitable for certain types of spells and personalities, the wand's core seems to have an even greater hold over the type of magic the wand is best at casting, as well as the individual who the wand will allow to use it, sometimes producing some very strange wands. In Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or philosophers depending on your country, early on Harry is brought to Ollivander's wand shop, who is thought to be the best wand maker of his time. Unlike other wand makers, Ollivander only ever uses three specific cores for his wands that he sees as the three superior cores. These three cores being Dragon Heartstring, that produces very strong and flamboyant spells, but is more prone to accidents, Unicorn Tell Hairs, that while producing weaker spells is much more loyal, stable, and reliable, while Phoenix Tell Feathers are extremely picky when it comes to their owners, but have high versatility and power, being best used in defense against the dark art type magic. Depending on the type of core used, it will react with the different types of woods in unique ways, affecting the wand's personality and magical abilities. For instance, Holly and Phoenix Feather were a difficult combination due to their opposite natures. But when such a wand found its perfect match, nothing and nobody should stand in their way. A cherry wand with Dragon Heartstring was ill-advised to be paired with a wizard who lacked exceptional self-control and strength of mind. A wand of Ash was wholly loyal due to its one true original master and would lose power and skill if passed to anyone else, especially if it had a unicorn hair core. As each wand is said by Ollivander to choose their wizard, it's not much surprise that no one really steals wands. Moreover, each wand from the moment it finds its ideal owner will begin to learn from and teach its human partner. And this brings us to an interesting insight of how wands actually produce spells, actually cause objects to float, shoot someone across the room like a shotgun blast, and why whatever unique wand you get is oriented towards a specific class of spells. So how do wands work? Ever notice a teapot just pouring itself, candles floating in midair, quills automatically checking and correcting spelling errors? We know that in Harry Potter, once instructed to do so, any item will do whatever it's commanded for as long as it's told to do so, whether the wizard who casts a spell is still around to watch it or not. In fact, only the specific type of spell cast and the power behind it is dependent on the witch or wizard. Like their wands, wizards don't produce magic. Magic is something that simply exists everywhere on its own, that wizards and their wands can tap into once they know how. For a wand to produce a simple spell, the person behind it must know how to perform the spell's specific gesture, as they say it's Latin-based incantation, with only skilled wizards casting spells without speaking, and incredibly skilled wizards casting spells of their choosing without a wand. Either way, all wizards and their wands are connecting to magic that just exists as an inert force of raw energy that can be shaped into doing something. And it makes sense that casting and creating new spells, crafting potions, learning about magic plants and their uses, all exist as literal science classes. People like 
like Snape, who teach potion making, are really teaching students something akin to a sweet chemistry class. Herbology teachers are teaching a class in literal botany, and witches and wizards who discover the many spells used in the world found them through the trial and error that comes with a scientific process. And now students who want to use known magic have to study and practice it, as with anything worth doing. And the process that a wand goes through to channel magical energy into something is just as scientific. When it comes to casting any spell, we tend to see something quite distinctive happen, being that with most every spell casted, we can see the spell itself take on a unique color, either when it's flying through the air or upon the spell's impact, depending on the spell and at times the type or class of magic it's considered to be. For instance, healing and protective magic like Protego and Expecto Patronum have a bluish hue, non-lethal attacking spells like Confrigo and Descendo are reddish in nature, while the unforgivable curses when seen tend to be green. And these are just the spells that are within the visible light spectrum, as other basic spells could be perceived as invisible, being made of colors that don't belong to our visible light spectrum. Color, while not only being some clever symbolism, also shows us the amount of power behind the magic spell, but also why your specific wand indeed chooses you. And before I begin signing off the other three dozen unique wand cores and how they match up with every type of wood, Let's cut to the chase. As noted by Ollivander, certain wands and wizards are better at producing certain classes of spells. Spells that all take on some sort of color, whether it be extremely obvious or far quicker and more subtle. But the thing about color, and thus the magical energy behind the spell itself, is that for a spell to have color in the first place means that it has a specific frequency, a specific energy and wavelength that it operates on. You see energy that takes on a reddish color color, and thus is towards the red end of the light spectrum, has a longer wavelength or otherwise a much lower energy to it, while anything towards the violet end of the spectrum is much more energetic and powerful, which makes sense that many of the attacking spells that we see like Expelliarmus and Stupefy are red in nature, while spells like Protego that cast an entire shield around Hogwarts or ones that are meant to rapidly heal someone's body are blue, as these types of spells require far more more energy to pull off and keep going. Even spells we see like Petrificus Totalis that are meant to free someone for a duration, and at times spells that are usually towards the red end of the spectrum shift the other way, when the person behind the wand puts a bit more energy into the spell. So while this means that if you ever see a Violet Stupefy spell coming at you, run screaming before you're blown apart, it also means that since spells tend to operate on a specific frequency or wavelength of energy, it's likely that certain wands being made up of different magic sensing woods and cores are better at picking up and converting magical energy into these specific energy spells over others. So when a wand is choosing a wizard, they are actually sensing if that witch or wizard is compatible when it comes to them being able to pick up on those same energy wavelengths or frequencies. An ability that can be in part, and in wand makers cases such as Ollivander's, can be read from looking at that witch or wizard's personality. With wand Wands like Harry's and Voldemort's that are said to be twins sharing a core from the same phoenix are thus able to operate at the same frequency, so when they duel the spells from their wands are able to connect. But if none of this was very interesting, then I saved an interesting fact for last. In the books, Hogwarts is mentioned to be full of too much magical energy in its air for any electronic device to work, which closely matches up with the science of Harry Potter's anti-gravity broom sticks. That would be nothing short of insane to have. So check out this video if you want to see how the things about your favorite characters and worlds work. See you in the next one.